My name is Shola Nuni and I'm a Senior Medical Director at Touch IME. It's my pleasure to be joined today by spoken word poet and rapper Duke Al, author of the recently published book of poetry, Bittersweet, The Highs, The Lows, Hypers and Hypos of Living with Type 1 Diabetes. Duke is from Vale of Glamorgan in Wales and was diagnosed with Type 1 Diabetes in 2018. Welcome, Duke. And I'm also joined by Dr. Sarah Ali, a visual artist and a doctor based in London, UK, who created the artwork for Bittersweet. She currently works as a consultant physician with a specialist interest in diabetes at the Royal Free Hospital. Welcome, Sarah. And today we're going to talk about the book, Bittersweet, and what the diabetes community might learn from it. So Duke, uh, Bittersweet was published in January this year. Can you tell us what prompted you to write the book and who is it for and what was the process behind it? So Bittersweet is for people who are living with type 1 diabetes. I wanted to create a book where people can uh, pick up and, and flick through the poems and uh, hopefully there's at least one poem for everybody in there that resonates with them. Um, just so you know they don't feel alone I'm, I'm i'm really for i have a slogan called i create to relate and educate so i'm really for relating to people and and, and having that uh shared experience because i think that's really comforting and uh yeah trying to then educate those who maybe don't understand what it's like to live with uh with type 1 diabetes because maybe they they have a friend, but they don't really get it, which which is understandable, absolutely fine. Or, you know, a family member. So it's for family members as well, friends and uh, and healthcare professionals. And uh, what prompted me to write the book, I've got an amazing friend, uh, Sarah Rackenier, and uh, she did the artwork for the book. And to cut a long story short, we had an awesome conversation. And it's something I was thinking about before, but without Sarah prompting me and really giving me the encouragement and confidence boost that I needed, I'm not sure the book would have happened. Um, so yeah, it was just through a beautiful friendship and collaboration, which is how the book was the book was formed, really. That's fantastic, Duke. And I've read the book and what struck me is that the content and the language is very unique, it's very contemporary, and it's so relatable, as you said. Uh, what feedback have you had from readers so far? So I've had some wonderful feedback. People are just getting in touch with me on social media uh, when they've read the book and saying, um, picking out, excuse me, picking out certain poems or maybe even just certain lines that have really resonated with their experience. A lot of parents whose children live with type 1 diabetes, uh, especially, have been messaging me saying, oh, thank you for this. Maybe I can, maybe they can sort of um, expect or learn something as, as their child grows up. So, for example, I, I talk about the, you know, the deeper depths of di what it's like to live with type 1 diabetes, such as mental health. Uh, and maybe, you know, it'll, it'll give parents that, that extra bit of information just to look out for when their, you know, children are growing up with it. Uh, but yeah, in general, you know, I've had just from, from the diabetes community, it's, it's been amazing. The support has been fantastic. Uh, and, you know, we're raising money for Diabetes UK and JDRF UK. So uh, it's just been quite overwhelming and I'm, I'm just really happy that I wrote the book <laughs> yeah absolutely and that's really important thanks Duke uh, so Sarah you created the artwork for the book uh, as a consultant physician with a special interest in diabetes tell us about how you came to combine medicine with art Oh, I think that so that question I could probably take a whole interview to answer <laughs> um, so I think one of the things I wanted to just highlight with this this question is that how we often think about science and the humanities being separate identities, separate entities, as it were, and that you either are good at science and you're, or you're good at art or you're good at humanities and you don't usually do the two together. I thought I was much better at science, so I went down the science route. Um, but I continued to dabble with art, um, but it was really quite late on in my life that I came back to art. I just always felt that there was something missing in my life and then colour and art just completely gave me this balance. Um, but the real thing for me was that I had still at this point, it was about 10 years ago, hadn't actually completed a painting in my whole entire life. 
And it was what I was a research fellow, actually at the time, looking at um, obesity, eating behavior um, in my research. And I was looking at lots of um, MRI scans and it sounds corny, but literally went to sleep and dreamt of a multicolored MRI brain scan. And the following morning, I thought, I've got to paint this. And I, I started painting it and it was my first ever painting. And it was the first time I felt in balance that had brought my love of art and my love of medicine together. And so now all I do is paint contemporary medical art um, and I paint um, different organs, uh, the heart, the brain, the pancreas, the lungs. But I bring into those images um, an abstract um, an abstract aspect. So, Sarah, tell us about how the collaboration with Duke came about. So just before lockdown, I got involved uh, with a small team of um, eight health uh, sorry, eight people who live with type 1 diabetes and um, another healthcare professional who all have an artistic background. So that's uh, musicians as well as artists who paint um, and photographers. And um, this team um, was involved in a project known as Artist, where the T is a capital T and the I is a one to stand for type one diabetes. Um, it was brought about to try and celebrate the um, artistic talents of people who live with type one diabetes and to sort of reassure people that people with type one diabetes can achieve anything. And so we then I, I came up with the idea that actually we should do an online event during COVID, um, which would be, allow us to share daily videos um, of people playing music, um, of dance, dancing, poetry, um, visual art, so that we could um, celebrate people, um, people with type 1 diabetes and their creative talent, but also um, to reduce anxiety created by social isolation. I was in charge of looking out for poetry, and that's when I came across Duke Owl's poetry, which was completely mind blowing. And um, eventually, um, Duke, who had been thinking about writing um, poems about living with type 1 diabetes already, um, I asked him to sort of take it forward and write a book about um, what it's like to live with type 1 diabetes. And so that's how Bittersweet came about. And I was honored to um, provide the artwork um, because Duke um, asked me to do it and, and the rest is history. Certainly is and we will have a look at, at uh, some of the artwork a bit later. Uh, thank you Sarah. Um, so Duke can you tell us about your experience of being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes as an adult and how that initially affected you? So being diagnosed as an adult I was 23 years old I'm now 27, so I've lived with type 1 diabetes for about four years. Um, yeah, being diagnosed as an adult was, it, it, you know, it came with its challenges. Uh, I went through a number of stages. First stage I went through was acceptance, which is a bit weird, really. <laughs> I had about four to six weeks of maybe, well, I, I can't remember now, but about, let's say, four weeks of thinking, oh, okay, you know, this it is what it is, something I've just got to get on with. I've got to inject insulin for the rest of my life, but actually, let's try and let's try and think this, use this as a positive because I wanted to get into like healthy eating and looking after myself anyway. So I just used it as an excuse to do that. Um. So after acceptance, then followed frustration. Uh, I then sort of came out of the acceptance phase and then realized, you know, how relentless the condition can be. Um, obviously not used to injecting at all, to injecting, you know, sometimes seven times a day, but let's just go with about, about five, two in the morning, uh, one in the morning for my slow releasing, one at night for my slow releasing. Then every time I eat, so let's say, let's say, for example, I eat three times a day. Um, yeah, it just became, it just became this relentless thing and I just got I just got this frustration like oh for crying out loud you know this is actually quite challenging you know um you know I've got to live with this for the rest of my life 
when I've already lived a life without type 1 diabetes. So, you know, because I knew what that was like and then transitioning into living with type 1 diabetes, that's what I found difficult. Um, so after frustration, then just came anger. I was just a, I was just angry. Uh, I sort of turned into like, why me? Because I grew up playing a lot of sport. In fact, my degrees in sports coaching. Um, I played rugby. I was good at athletics. Just, gen- just generally enjoyed playing sport, and I was good at it as well. And I had this feeling within me that um, because I've now got type one diabetes, which I saw as a weakness, I just thought I was a weaker version of myself. And I've always had this thing within me that to always try wanting to reach my full physical potential, whether that's in the gym or or at, at a certain sport. Then came self-destruction. Um, I was neglecting insulin. I was eating, drinking, whatever I want again, um, which, as you can imagine, was not very good for me. Uh, yeah, my blood sugar levels were sky high. I just really wasn't looking after my body, but I was just in this mode of self-destruction. And, yeah, just this all happened within the space of a year, and it was just quite a, a bit of a roller coaster, pardon the cliche, <laughs> a roller coaster of emotions. And also, you know, even though my cousin's got type 1 diabetes, I didn't really know what type 1 diabetes was. And I guess, you know, not everybody's going to know what type 1 diabetes is unless they really know somebody who they're close to, a family member, or they get it themselves. Um, So that's what the book's there for as well, to try and help spread that awareness and that deeper understanding of of what type 1 diabetes is. And I also didn't know the difference between type 1 and type 2. So, um, yeah, so it's been very educational as well, being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. <laughs> Such an interesting story, Duke. Thank you. So, Sarah, the artwork has a very diverse style in the book, from photography to paintings to sketches. Can you talk about what inspired you when creating the artwork for the book? Okay, so the very simple answer is Duke's amazing poetry. That's what inspired me. Um, so the longer answer, because I'm assuming that's what you really want, um, is that um, before I created Bittersweet, my artwork had a very distinct um, look. You could recognise my artwork. It's all about the human body. Um, it's very geometrical. It's full of lots of colour. And then I bring in different medical investigations um, or text great from Grey's Anatomy into the, the artwork. Um, But for this book, um, the poetry collection, I think Duke really stretched me and we thought that we'd try and do something that's really um, covering all types of um, sort of styles of art. And that's really to reflect the poetry and the styles of poems and the differences in topics as well that's in the book. Um, But essentially... Uh, it really was Duke's inspiring and beautiful, powerful words that helped me create the artwork. And Sarah, I love the drawing of the pancreas and also the sweet teeth collage. Do you have any favourite pieces of artwork and why? So that's a really hard question to answer because when I create any piece of work, it, um, I I give a lot of Um, and put in a lot of emotion and love. I think probably for me, um, there are two pieces of artworks that actually um, I love the most. So there's one that I think on screen at the moment, and this is the artificial pancreas. Um, I actually created this artwork um, whilst I was working with um, the team of people for artists. And... um, and what I really find inspiring are these people, people with li- living with type 1 diabetes are truly inspirational. They have to make approximately 180 extra decisions per day. And I wanted to create a piece of art that um, was like homage to them in a way. I was, de- I was um, dedicating it to how inspiring they are. So this um, piece of art is the first pancreas that I painted. And you can see the pancreas in the middle and surrounded by um, the Libra and uh, continuous glucose monitoring data from the people that I was working with in artists. 
and um, the copper lines are trying to represent this um, circuitry um, computer like hardboard um, circuit board sort of creating an artificial pancreas um, and that's how this came about. The second um, piece of artwork that is um, sort of joint favorite for me uh, is uh, is called is possible and the reason why that's um, my favorite um, is because it's a nod to our first collaboration so you can my first collaboration um, color colorblind and it's quite similar to that. So we talk a bit about the content. You mentioned uh, at the beginning, hidden hypos. And to me, that was a really powerful message, um, not least about you feeling judged about experiencing um, hypoglycemic episodes. Can you tell us more about that, about hidden hypos? And do you have advice for patients and for clinicians on that issue? Yeah, so hidden hypos was just about it, it just sort of one. It's one of those poems that just sort of I had the idea, and I thought, oh, actually, yeah, and it started to just flow out of me. Um, I believe it was only the second ever poem I wrote on on living with type one diabetes. The first poem I ever wrote was my story, so this was the second, and this was actually prompted by Sarah um, for for artist. Uh, Sarah asked me to uh, write a poem specifically about you know living with type one diabetes, and I was like, oh, okay, I accept the challenge. That's cool. Yeah, and this this came to me and it just flowed out of me. And basically it's about being in different situations, having a hypo, because I've experienced it when I've been in work. You know, I'm having a hypo in work. I do grounds maintenance and uh, looking after buildings and events. But when I'm doing grounds maintenance, for example, let's say I'm strimming grass or cutting grass, obviously that's exercise. And sometimes exercise can um, can cause a hypo because you maybe not quite accounted for as much how much exercise or activity you're doing so yeah even in work i've sort of like felt like i've had to hide hide a hypo because i don't want don't want the guys in work to be like oh he's skiving off work again uh and then you know in the gym i've had a hypo and again it's that weak that same thing that i keep saying like i don't want to be seen as weak so i just say like oh i just need to go and grab a drink quick um you know in all different situations i've had a i've even started having a hypo when just having a conversation with somebody and I'm <laughs> I'm like sort of like holding the conversation because I don't want to walk away and, and then think I'm rude. So yes, yeah, so, so this is why I call it called it hidden hypos because you you pretend that you're fine, but it gets to a put you know, really you need to run off and sort yourself out. Uh and I just I, I just assumed if I'm writing from real experiences, then maybe other people are going through the same thing. And it seemed to resonate with a lot of people. Um, I think a lot of people hide their hypos because they're, it's, I think it's a natural thing to be worried about what people are going to think. Absolutely. Thank you, Duke. So, uh, Duke, the forgotten appointment, that seems to be a direct message to clinicians about addressing the mental health of patients with diabetes. What would you say to them about incorporating mental health check into routine care? Yeah, I, I wanted to. I wanted to write a poem which, um, which brings up all these th really important things that when we go to see our consultants, like these are all brought up, and of course they're very important questions, and you know uh, we need these all these things checked, and you know go on a Daphne course, yes please, and things like that, but you know even though they might ask how you are, there's not really that mental health support. And that's not the consultant's fault. Um, but I just think that when diagnosed with a chronic illness or condition, sorry, um, for me, I was, even though I was an adult, like I also live with OCD. So basically they, they basically battled each other but my OCD and type 1 diabetes had like a battle with each other when I was first diagnosed and they still do to this day. And it was difficult to manage my mental health and manage my type 1 diabetes. There'd be times where there'd be days where I just wouldn't inject insulin because I was so overwhelmed with trying to deal with intrusive thoughts and then compulsions and trying to not do that. Yeah. So basically I was just, I just wanted 
people to read this and think, yeah, do you know what? Maybe maybe my mental health is, has not really been taken into consideration as much. I know this is a physical condition, but it affects me mentally. And I'm trying to like get people or or uh, doctors, consultants, um, psych psychologists to look at the whole body, like the body as a whole, rather than just like uh, dividing different, let's say, illnesses um, into categories. Because I have OCD, but I also have type one diabetes. That's me as a whole person. For me, you, I need to be treated, but uh, with, with both. <laughs> how am I trying to say this? They need to be treated. They both need to be treated equally, and they both need to be treated as me as a person rather than trying to split them up that's what i was trying to say so i'm i'm i I would love to see like psychologists or just mental health support be there um with our daily uh, our monthly routines going to check up on our type 1 diabetes just to just have that extra support really duke you've written several poems about the exhaustion and the stress of living with type 1 diabetes uh, so Burnt Out is uh, one of the poems that illustrates that, as well as how friends can frequently misunderstand the condition. So uh, Sugar Coated, for example, and Daniel, Keith and Andrew. Can you talk a bit about those issues and what advice do you have for friends and family of those with diabetes regarding providing support? Yeah, Burnt Out is actually one of my favourite poems that I've written, that I wrote for the book. Um, burnt out, as you said, is about living with diabetic burnout. Um, and I'd say, you know, that that happens from time to time. I guess different people experience it in different ways. It might happen for longer for some, might happen shorter for others. But I imagine most people will get diabetic burnout in some shape or form, unfortunately. And again, it's, uh, you know, I touched on this earlier, it's just about how, how relentless the, con- the condition is. Uh, every single day you know you, you can even have a day where you like you think you've nailed it you know you've, you've carb counted really bang on and and uh you know you're like yeah i've eaten i've eaten really well today actually i think i've been bang on all day and you know doing well i've trained and then i you check you check your sugar uh your blood sh- glucose levels and they're sky high and you're like what's going on like what do i need to do or you hypo you know and and that's when that's for me anyway, when it gets a bit exhausting and you're like, oh, crying out loud. So that's what burnt out is a bit about, really. And I say at the end of burnt out, um, I just want to taste how it used to feel to eat a carbohydrate loaded meal without the stress. And that's literally how I feel. Yeah, sugar coated. Uh, I've actually had a, you know, a friend say, say to me, oh, you can just run high for one night, you know. When you know on a night out, you know when I'm having having a few a few beers, let's say, and and then some food with friends, they're like, oh, you can just run high for one night, and it's like, well, no, I can't really because it's it's not good for me, um, and it is dangerous. It comes with it comes with its dangers, even if you excessively drink. That, from what I've learned, unfortunately through experience, that comes with massive dangers, and it's really scary. Um, again, going back to my stages of. Uh, self uh, destruction stuff when I experience these horrible things, but um, yeah, again, it's 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 not it's not our friend's fault, but then it is at the same time. And what I mean, what I mean by that is, it's not our friend's fault because I don't expect them to know the ins and outs of what it's like to live with type one diabetes. But then it's also our friend's fault, yes, because just because they want to drink and have a laugh, it's it's the same if I didn't have type one diabetes and say I didn't want to drink, and then you got people nudging you going, oh come on, mate, just have a pint, just have a pint just because they want to have a good time and they want to drink with somebody else. Uh, that's what I find difficult. Um, and But living with type 1 diabetes, it's then that added pressure and that and that, that much more harder to to deal with. So I guess it's peer pressure. Um, I'm quite happy to say no now, but it can be a tough thing. So I wanted to say, mention that in the, in the book because it's something that I've experienced and I'm sure others have experienced it as well. And maybe if others haven't experienced it, they might be prepared for it when they get older. So Daniel Keith Andrew uh, actually stands for DKA and the um, poem talks about uh, how fatal or, well, yeah, fate, well, it's not quite fatal in the poem, but how dangerous excessive drinking can be, um, you know, when 
when living with type 1 diabetes and it can be uh so yeah i wanted to raise raise awareness on that side of it as well because i think i've heard a story of something like this happening within the poem of somebody drinking too much and them actually dying or you know from it uh whether they hit dka ridiculously fast and kept going i don't know how it happened this is just something i heard again just wanted to raise awareness for that topic really Duke, I uh, know you wanted to talk about Perfect, and Perfect is a poem about you coping with obsessive compulsive disorder, um, which is a condition that you also um, have. Can you tell us about that and how it impacts upon you managing your diabetes? Yeah, so Perfect, uh, I don't think I actually mentioned obsessive compulsive disorder within the poem, um, but I was hinting at it throughout because there is a huge misconception with people living with OCD that that things have to be perfect or have to be in order. Um, that's that's not what OCD is. That that is perfectionism, which is why the poem's called Perfect. Um, OCD is more about having intrusive thoughts. Um, let's say I wanted to line up books from A to Z um, and have them, you know, in perfect order. So somebody else might be next to me doing the same thing and they want them, or they, they walk away and think, oh, that doesn't quite look right, I don't like that. It might not be aesthetically pleasing. So for them, that's they're probably a bit of a perfectionist because they want it to look good. But for me, uh, if I had to do that task, it would be because I'd have an intrusive thought. For example, if I don't do this now, a family member's going to die, which is completely irrational. I know it's completely irrational, but I can't help but have, feel that responsibility on my shoulders but what if I didn't do it and somebody died? So it's almost like you've got the responsibility of a loved one's life on your shoulders, which, and then you get into a repetitive cycle of, oh, did I do it correctly? Did I do it enough times? And you're back and forth. It's, it's full of anxiety, full of stress. It's difficult. It's hard. It's not nice. And the, the hard thing is, is not doing the compulsions. Um, so basically, yeah, so perfect is about just not, like it's okay not to be perfect um it's okay to it's okay to accept your imperfections and and that and that's what i mean with diabetes as well i'm not going to have my blood between four and seven every single day it's not going to happen as much as i'd love it to happen it's not going to happen <laughs> sara this book is raising funds for the charities diabetes uk and JGRF UK. Can you tell us more about the support that these organisations provide to patients with diabetes and their carers? Yes, so um, both the fantastic organisations, charity organisations, um, JGRF mainly focuses for people with living with type 1 diabetes, whereas Diabetes UK is to, to all types of diabetes. Um, and actually, uh, they they actually both support um, not only patient, people living with diabetes and um, their carers, but also healthcare professionals and research. The charities are involved at different levels. They're involved in giving um, support from day to day living um, with um, with diabetes, but with also with public engagement, policy, um, engaging with policymakers um, and engaging with governments. And the real aim is to, um, to drive research, uh, but also to um, ensure that there is funding and advocacy work and projects carried out to try and improve the lives of people living with diabetes. And that's looking at thinking about curing diabetes, treating diabetes, living with diabetes and preventing diabetes, but also reducing health inequalities that we quite often see um, in medicine in general, but also in diabetes. Sarah, what do you hope the book will achieve for people with diabetes and their carers and for the diabetes community as a whole? So I have three hopes um, for the future for this with this book. So the first is, is um, so thinking about people with diabetes and their carers, we hope that it provides 
a form of peer support. So through Duke's um, powerful words, people will be able to relate and realize that they're not alone and that they can um, that they can reach out to others that will be going through this with regards to carers they will also res the feelings will also resonate with them but also will help with uh, a form of education uh, so people can understand what it's like to live with diabetes so the second hope is um for the diabetes um for further diabetes community so that's thinking about the healthcare professionals um because these poems whilst duke has mentioned how they're, they were written for people who live with diabetes. I think actually that this is a really powerful way for um, the, the healthcare professionals to equip themselves with understanding what it's like to live with type 1 diabetes. We often focus on glucose levels, what's your HbA1c like, and Duke highlights that with and he's talked about it today about for forgotten appointment and actually it is also healthcare professionals responsibility to actually ask how the person with diabetes is and it's not just how the diabetes is it's how they really are and focus on the those other important aspects with living with diabetes and now the third hope is um that i will continue collaborating with duke because we've seen the response to um this um poetry book and we've we've obviously got the creative buzz um from it uh, but we want to um, duke is hoping that he's going to write some more poetry collections that will one be for specifically for education to the the larger community to the carers to friends to employers um to healthcare professionals and i can help him um do the artwork to that and then the second book will be hopefully looking at um, children living with diabetes. So those are my three hopes for the future. Great hopes for the future, Sarah. And um, yes, uh, really look forward to seeing the, uh, the follow up work from, from uh, Duke and you. Uh, so Duke, this is the moment I've been um, most excited about for this <laughs> interview. Uh, it's uh, now 100 years since the discovery of insulin. And you wrote this uh, fantastic poem, If It Wasn't For You, which is a poignant celebration of that. Please would you do us the honor of rounding off the interview uh, by um, reciting some of this piece. It'd be my pleasure. If it wasn't for you, my life would be different. Maybe I'd have wings and a halo that glistens or be on my bed of rest, sitting there wishing for a miracle treatment to save me from missing my life in all of its magnificent beauty. If it wasn't for you, my life would be different. I'd be afraid, locked in diabetic prison, seeking escape from the life sentence I was given, trapped in beta cells, victim of my immune system, where trialing my innocence was my new duty. If it wasn't for you, my life would be different. I'd be like an unfinished, lost composition. Unable to share my cool flair, rhyme and rhythm, these words of my poem would never have been written. An artist whose career has been mismanaged. The story starts way back in 1881, on the 14th of November in Canada, Alliston. The birth of William and Margaret's famous son, who will help change the world in fighting type 1. A smart young man who began to advance in his incredible mind, an imagination enhanced, to learn to ask questions, a plan to understand, puzzles at hand connecting intricate pieces like DNA strands, stretching his knowledge like an unbreakable elastic band, absorbing information like his brain was quicksand. This man had Im ambition in his life, he took command to leave a long lasting legacy on the land. He researched day and night, determined to figure out the reason why. Schaefer's named hormone, insulin had died. Without insulin, a human cannot survive. The metabolism of sugar needed to be revived, as the body urinated sugar to try and stay alive. Previously, starvation diets were all that were prescribed. That would give a diabetic an extra two years of life. Moses Barron published an article which grabbed his attention. Once trypsin secreting cells died, insulin could be extracted from the Langerhans. He created a method of his own invention. 
McLeod provided facilities to begin to begin experimentation. The assistants Charles Best and James Collip helped with production. They successfully extracted insulin from an adult pancreas in 1921. Now type 1 could be treated using insulin injections. The first was, was given in 1922 on January the 11th to 14-year-old Canadian Leonard Thompson. In 1994, the year I was born, he was inducted into the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame. In 2004, he was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. That same year, he was nominated as one of the top 10 greatest Canadians ever. I wish he could be alive so I could sincerely thank him. Who is he? He is the extraordinary Sir Frederick Grant Banting. Because of you, now my life is not different. I can do anything with my cool rhymes and rhythm. Happy World Diabetes Day and happy birthday you've given us diabetics billions of years worth living. As we celebrate 100 years since the discovery of insulin, this poem is my tribute to you. Wherever you are, I hope you've liked what I've written. Thank you very much. I love that, Duke. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for all your insights today. Really educational, really inspiring. And uh, thank you, Sarah, too, for, for, your, um, for your input to this interview. Thank you both. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for having us. It's an honour. Yeah, thanks for having us. I appreciate it.